Hello and welcome. My name is Mike Saunders and I'll be your host and moderator for our discussion today. For many decades, the United States has been known for all intents and purposes as the most powerful nation on earth with its political and economic influences seen across the globe. Meantime, the Soviet Union was a force to be reckoned with until its collapse in 1991. But in recent years, we've seen an upsurge in Chinese growth to the point where China is set to overtake the U.S. as the world's leading economic power, at least according to a report in the Financial Times earlier this year. Add to this the rapidly unfolding events on the world stage that suggest Russia may be battling back to reclaim its former glory days, and you can see the makings of a dramatic power shift coming in the future. Or can we? Joining me in the studio to hopefully make some sense of the shifting trends of world power are three August professors at Brock University. Charles Burton, Associate Professor of Political Science and China expert. David Schimmelpenning, History Professor and Russia expert. And Blaine Haggard, Assistant Professor of Political Science and a United States expert. So, let me throw out the first question to all of you as we welcome you into the studio, first of all. Is the sun indeed rising in the east and setting in the west? Who wants to take this first of all? Well, I think that, um, you know, certainly from the point of view of the government of China, there is a desire to have the world understood in that way that it's a zero-sum game and that China is on the ascendancy and the United States is in decline. So they buy into the decline and fall model. I think that you know, the reason that, that this is such an imperative for the Chinese government is because of the basis of the legitimacy of the current regime, which is inclined to put a lot of stress on China's recovery from uh, Western imperialism in the uh, 19th century up to when China was, um, uh, when the, the current regime, the People's Republic of China regime, came in in 1949. So people in China. Um, have a certain victimization mentality that the country was kept weak because of the rise of the West, which is represented by the United States, and they see the they they derive some some I guess national psychological satisfaction from the idea that China can redress the past and become the dominant power on the on the globe and at the same time debase the dominance of the United States. So it's not a very healthy. Um, understanding of the global order, but it does feed into the basis for the current regime, and nationalism um, uh, feeds on this kind of, uh, of notion that China will become number one and the rest will feel sorry that they had not been more respectful of China in the past. So I, uh, but objectively speaking, I'm not sure that one can do straight line projections of Chinese growth and see China exceeding the United States um, in years ahead because, you know, naturally China is a relatively undeveloped country with a low economic basis. It's going to see high growth rates as it uh, industrializes, but once China achieves a certain level of, say, you know, maybe $5,000 per capita, then you're, you're unlikely to see sustained growth rates of 10 or 15 percent that would take it over the United States. And there are other factors in China's current economic development that suggest that the economy may be stagnating. So I think that the, the notion that there's a fundamental change in the global order and the United States will sort of wither away and a China-dominated global order will, will rise into the ascendancy and displace the current institutions that define uh, how international behavior occurs in the world is, um, is one that it's really too soon to be able to, to suggest that things are going to go the way the Chinese government suggests that they may. I, I'm, yeah, I mean, when I was thinking about it, well, what's the world going to look like, say, 30 years from now? So I thought, well, what did, what did the world look like uh, 30 years ago in terms of who's on top? And so who's on top back in the 1984? You had uh, the United States, of course. You had the Soviet Union, no, Russia. Um, and, you had, uh, and you had the big scare at the time was, um, was the rise of, of the Asian tigers, specifically Japan. And, you, you know, you got a lot of entertaining... Um, a little bit of xenophobia out of that. I'm thinking of you know Wesley Snipes, Sean Connery, and Rising Sun as being a good artifact of that time. Big worry being is that uh, Japan is going to be the big country coming in to to, to take everything over. Um, 
and also at the same time too between the Soviet Union and uh, and uh, the United States. Um, well, the end of the Cold War caught everybody by surprise, including including uh, you know Russian experts, everybody by surprise. And so it's that kind of made me think. Well, I was thinking two things. First of all, um, it's kind of like what Charles was saying. It's really really difficult um, to, or if not impossible, um, to project. You know, where is this all going to end up? Um, and secondly, speaking from the U.S. perspective, is that it's never really a good idea to count the United States out. They've got a lot of assets for them. Um, they're largely responsible for creating uh, the rules of the international system that we have today and so they, you know, when you create them you get privileged by them and so you will be able to kind of use that to maintain your position for, for quite a while. Yeah, I don't, I don't really see um, either China or, <clears throat> or Russia for that matter being a good alternative model um, for, for many people abroad. Um, I mean, certainly people in Africa, uh, certain people in Africa are certainly happy to see a lot of Chinese investment. Um, but, you know, if you are, say, um, <clears throat> some, some a dictator's wife um, or dictator himself and you're going to go into exile, uh, if you have a choice, uh, you're going to go to uh, the States um, as opposed to, say, uh, Shanghai or, uh, um, or Moscow. Um, <clears throat> America still has a, a tremendous amount of attraction. I think this makes things a little bit more troubling because um, there is a certain bit of envy. Um, now Charles knows much more about China, but certainly I see that a lot in Russia. Uh, the Russians are tremendously envious because they are no longer the <clears throat> um, one of the two poles. Um, they, they are sort of, they've sort of been whittled down a little bit. Um, and for a lot of Russians that's very hard to take. Look at how long it took uh, France to uh, understand that it was no longer um, a great power. Talking about uh, China's trade with Africa, we were talking, uh, touching base there on Africa. Uh, the trade between the two of them rose to 200 billion last year, according to a report in The Guardian, largely made up of Beijing's imports of oil and minerals and export of electronics and textiles. Now that's more than double the US and far ahead of the EU. So 20 years ago, between China and Africa, the trade was just about 6 billion. So is this the trend then, China becoming the economic engine in the world and Africa an ever-increasing market to exploit? Well, I think certainly China needs some um, natural resources to f fuel its uh, economic rise. I mean, after all, China's population is about a quarter of the entire planet. So, you know, as, as things develop, China needs more resources and they have to source them from somewhere. And developing infrastructure in sub-Saharan Africa to bring those um, resources to market is something that, uh, that uh, um, works very well for the Chinese. I think our main concern um, with the Chinese model in, in Africa is the Chinese tendency to um, uh, derive benefit by supporting repressive regimes which then facilitate the Chinese state in being able to um, uh, be competitive in, in the uh, ex extraction market. So uh, because of the distinctive nature of the Chinese system where the state-owned enterprises are functions of uh, ministries of the Chinese government, then the Chinese government is able to use um, all the resources at its disposal to further Chinese national interests in its relations with third world countries. So, you know, um, not only will China be trading with an African country, but they'll offer an honorary doctorate to Robert Mugabe for his contributions to world diplomacy. They will um, provide benefits to the families of third world dictators, which then facilitates their ability to say extract resources without paying tax um, to the you know to the to the country where the resources come from and uh, they will provide military support for regimes that facilitate the the export of these resources so i think from that point of view um, there are some concerns there but that being said in terms of whether uh, china's um, investment in africa is of overall benefit to african development you're looking at quite a low bar because after all, we're comparing French colonialism, Belgian colonialism, British colonialism, and American colonialism in there. And one has seen, a, you know, in general, uh, over some years until relatively recently, that the rate of economic growth in Sub-Saharan Africa has not kept pace with the expansion of, of um, the population. So in other words, per capita incomes have declined. If we see in those countries that, that um, the Chinese development engenders genuine wealth there,
and people are able to enjoy a better living standard. Of course, that would be um, a terrific point in, in the favor of the Chinese model. Yeah, I, I wonder uh, actually about that. Uh, one of the things that's been uh, brought up as evidence is kind of a general U.S. decline is the uh, is the, for instance, the 2008 global financial crisis discrediting essentially the you know free movement of capital and uh, and also uh, also linked to the uh, development model based on free trade. So the United States, I guess, is losing a little bit of its, of its moral authority and credibility on economic issues when it comes to actually what is the best way to develop. And in terms of, the, in terms of well, you know, the, what's being called the Beijing Consensus, in a sense, it's, it seems to me, and I'd be curious to see what you guys think about this, but it seems to me to be just a kind of a, a version of what we used to have, for instance, in the 1950s and 1960s, which is essentially saying at very basic level, we need more government involvement in the economy versus the U.S. model of um, government off to one side, let, let a, you know, a million free markets uh, bloom. Well, that certainly uh, <clears throat> seems to be the trend, although it's, it's very much disguised. It seems to, very much seems to be the trend in, in Russia, where there's, uh, there's a retrenchment both economically and, um, uh, and politically to a certain extent. Um, but I, I don't think, um, I mean, the sta state-run systems have been so discredited, um, especially with, with the collapse of the Eastern Bloc, I don't quite see um, <clears throat> a, a return to, to complete uh, dirigisme quite yet. Oh, no, no. No, I mean, and what I'm saying is more of just uh, what used to be called uh, embedded liberalism. I don't know if you'd call it uh, embedded illiberalism if it's coming from an authoritarian <laughs> government, but what about something along those lines where, you know, the, uh, I'm not a Russian expert, but uh, it's my understanding that there is a, there's quite a bit of state involvement in the economy there as well. Exactly, exactly. I mean, uh, uh, Putin has very cleverly, um, has there's sort of an unwritten agreement with, uh, with Russian oligarchs is that, is that Putin lets them be um, as long as they don't engage in, in political activity. And of course, if you, once you cross that line, uh, well, as Khodorkovsky found out to his, to his dismay, um, <clears throat> then immediately there, there people will find tax irregularities. And of course, it's impossible in Russia to do business without uh, breaking some sort of law. But the Chinese have had some negative experiences with massive investments in authoritarian regimes. I mean, for example, in Libya, the Chinese losses with the collapse of Gaddafi are estimated to be 18 billion U.S. dollars because of the loss of contracts and destruction of, of uh, infrastructure. And the successor regime has not been willing to collaborate with the Chinese state enterprises because they identify the Chinese government as having supported the the repressive regime, and we see this in, in smaller ways in other countries. So I think that that is one imperative why the Chinese government has become interested in investing um, in a stable uh, liberal democracy where there's guaranteed rule of law, like Canada, um, for sourcing um, resources. So um, you know, the, I, it may be that even the Chinese are concerned about uh, too much reliance on authoritarian dictatorships and they may feel that it's better to go to places that have more political stability and economic predictability. There are also, I mean, there are other issues, I think, in general about the concerns within Africa about the Chinese investment. Um, you know, the Chinese, um, when they undertake a project, typically uh, don't engage local labor but bring the labor in from China. There are concerns about Chinese commitments uh, when they undertake projects to local development, uh, schools and hospitals and environmental cleanups that haven't been fulfilled. But you know, this is largely anecdotal data, and we don't really know, you know, to what extent it's it's generalized. But there certainly is a lot of anecdotal data about African local communities who feel that that their regimes are selling selling out their resources and environment um, to benefit the Chinese state. And so it's a different model of, of um, involvement in the third world. It seems to be mostly based on economic principles and some degree of compensation. In other words, um, you know, Chinese get the African uh, resources uh, of various types and then um, give a compensation trade by producing, by, by selling uh, cheap uh, Chinese consumer goods into those markets. But I, I, still, uh, I still think that it's too early to really assess this. And, I mean, while I agree that there's a terrific amount of, of investment by the Chinese state in Africa, the, the 
the proportion of Chinese external investment in sub-Saharan Africa is still relatively small compared to Chinese external investment everywhere because there is no country in the world that I'm aware of that doesn't have extensive Chinese investment. And, and uh, you know, Canada could have a lot more if our government was not um, resistant to uh, 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 takeover of, of Canadian firms by the Chinese state. And if they build a certain pipeline? Sorry? If they build a certain pipeline to the Pacific? Well, I think certainly that's a concern about Canada, but you know, the Nexon deal is, is an example. Um, you know, the government of Canada decided that the Chinese state acquisition of Nexon would be the last time that, that China hold its ball as gets a controlling interest in a company. They paid $15 billion for it and, and made certain commitments with regard to the management structure and um, location of the headquarters which uh, a year later the Chinese government are reneging on, which is, you know, not, it's not, not just the Chinese government. We've had experience with a lot of state firms when they acquire Canadian firms uh, that were dependent on, on fulfillment of certain conditions that they don't fulfill them when conditions change. So I think from that point of view, um, you know, there is a, a, a degree of concern about um, becoming too dependent on uh, Chinese state funds for development because the Chinese state is not as reliable a, a, a maintainer of contracts as some others. Um, the, you know, the PetroChina commitments to Athabasca, I think it was 123 billion that we're now not certain if they'll fulfill because it turns out that, you know, that the deal was not as favorable to the Chinese side as the Chinese had anticipated. I mean, these kinds of things add a degree of a lack of pred predictability in, in global relations. And because you're dealing with the whole Chinese state, it's much harder to gain recourse if you feel that they are not fulfilling their obligations. Yeah, doesn't that uh, doesn't that lack of uh, reliability or, or, or trustworthiness or rule of law or what have you? It, it would seem to me that would be something that would hold China back from being um, um, from being uh, from moving from being a dominant player in the system, which is kind of what they're coming to becoming uh, the player which could um, very much shape that system. Is that what's going on here? Or? I well, think that what you're looking at is because these things are controlled by the Chinese state, mm -hmm. the companies which may be pursuing the company's national interest are then directed by the Chinese Communist Party to, to engage in, in uh, actions which serve the interests of the state overall, but may not serve the interests of the company. So mm -hmm. relations, I don't know, um, you know, the, the Western state leader meets with the Dalai Lama, and then the state firm is told to not agree to the to the contract that they had previously, um, you know, signed a preliminary agreement with. So this adds a level of complication to the relationship, and also it, it it allows the Chinese state to expand its influence by sending out a clear signal that if you engage in this kind of behavior, um, you know, this is what's going to happen. In the most recent case of two Canadians in in northeastern China who have been arrested on charges of espionage that appear to be trumped up in direct retaliation for a statement made by our Prime Minister, uh, uh, you know, goes to show how the, the, uh, the regime offers. I, I don't, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to characterize it as illegal or going against the norms. They operate with different norms than, than the accepted norms that have been created by the United States and the Western powers in the post-Second World War bargain. And there, there is, of course, some concern also about, about China's geopolitical aims, and I think very clearly that's the case in, in Russia. Um, on the one hand, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the Moscow very much wants to present itself sort of as a counterweight um, to the West, and, and therefore there's a lot of verbiage about helping other, or, or about being aligned with other Asian states, um, such as, say, uh, India, um, Iran, and especially China. Uh, but on the other hand, there's a, there's a real fear that, that of course, um, <clears throat> parts of Russia are, are very, very vulnerable to, uh, to China. The, uh, uh, China still considers the Treaty of Aigun in 1858 and of Peking of 1860. These were the treaties which basically handed over very large tracts of Manchuria um, to Russia. Um, they consider that to be an unequal treaty, and they consider those lands still to be, to be Russian. So from the perspective of people in Russia's far east, um, the situation looks looks very gloomy. In fact, what's, what's fascinating is that there's been a real revival of sort of yellow peril literature that was quite um, prominent at the turn of the 20th century, uh, is now once again uh, prominent in, in places like Khabarovsk and uh, Vladivostok. 
Yeah. I mean, on, there's some basis. I mean, the terrific number of Chinese traders have moved into the Soviet, uh, the Russian Far East, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, well, you know, and they and they do affect the local economy. Well, not only that, but uh, the Russian Far East has depopulated the whole Far Eastern region. I had a population before the uh, end of the Soviet Union of about 10 million. Now it's uh, about 6.2 million. Um, so that anybody with any ambition has tried to, you know, has tried to leave that region. So it is, it is becoming depopulated, which is, which is a very worrisome thing to, to local governors there because they do know that they're sitting on a treasure house of, of raw materials, uh, which hitherto have not been terribly efficiently developed. Including Canada to impose a series of sanctions against Russian banks and companies. Recently, for example, Canada announced new economic and travel sanctions against Russian banks and high-ranking officials. Russia's responded in kind, of course, but is Canada's influence slighted best in a case like this, eliciting a little more than a yawn from the Russian bear? Uh, I, I think it's even less than slight. Um, <clears throat> Canada is basically uh, an, an angry gnat as far as the Russians are concerned. Um, I mean, I have to say that from my own perspective, uh, until about five years ago, it was always a plus to have a Canadian passport as opposed to an American passport. Um, Traveling in Russia? Or you're traveling in Russia, yeah. yeah, yeah, traveling in Russia. But but now now the reverse is true for those who actually pay attention to those, such things. I mean, most people uh, completely disregard Canada, and and Canada is is after all a very small bit player um, in 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 Russian politics. Um, economically, also our trade is not so tremendously um, great. Um, <clears throat> so really, it doesn't. Uh, Canada has absolutely no leverage, and what what really discounts any influence the Canadians have right now is is the current uh, Harper regime's um, <clears throat> sort of craven pandering to, uh, to to the Ukrainian ethnic vote, and everybody in Russia knows that that's precisely what is driving um, uh, Harper's um, uh, extreme uh, hostility. I mean, ironically, you know, now now Harper is a cold warrior, and Barack Obama seems to be reasonable. A complete switch from situation even 20 years ago. It certainly, you know, Russia has an enormous border with Canada across the north, and we haven't been able to to benefit from this neighbor relationship to the extent that we really should. Uh, maybe with global warming, if it you know, melts the, the trade routes, we'll be doing more with them. But I, I do think that there is a perception among Canadians um, that, you know, Canada's an important country and we lead the world in peacekeeping and so on. But, you know, it's not so much that Canada has um, reduced in its uh, overall uh, political economic heft, but that other countries have come up. So, you know, while after the Second World War, Canada had a significant army ranked, I think, number four in the world, uh, today, arguably, we don't have the kind of influence of, say, a South Korea, which is a country with higher, much higher population and comparable economic levels. So. The notion that the people around the world are paying attention to what, whatever statements our leaders are making is, is probably a bit self-deceiving and, and based on a, on a nostalgia for a period when perhaps Canada was important, particularly in the decolonization process after the Second World War, but which really doesn't exist anymore. I, you know, I, I think that probably um, peacekeeping as, a, as an ideal died in the Rwandan tragedy. I really don't see Canada reassuming a, a position of either m military, economic, or moral authority in the world anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't have anything really to add myself on, on the Canadian position in Ukraine, but I'm just thinking about the overall issue of, of the uh, Russian-Ukraine relations right now. I'm thinking it's important not to exaggerate or over-exaggerate this, especially when we're talking about you know the rise of the United States or or the decline of the United States and the possible rise of China and, and the renewal of Russia, is that this seems to me at least to be a very, uh, it's more of a regional conflict as opposed to a global conflict. When you think about, you know, back 30 years ago when the real problem was complete nuclear annihilation of the entire world, um, this is, um, this is a, a problem, very important problem, but on a much smaller level. I, I agree with you entirely. It is a regional conflict and uh, hopefully it'll stay that way. I, I suspect it will. Um, I mean, of course, one never knows um, to, to what extent uh, Putin uh, will sort of feel pressure to, to intervene. Um, <clears throat> hopefully, hopefully he won't, um, because after all, even if the, uh, uh, the, 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 the pro-Russian elements are driven out of Donetsk, as seems feasible, uh, 
um, given that it's not completely surrounded by Ukrainian, uh, by a reinvigorated Ukrainian army. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the Russians could still uh, sort of sponsor low-level guerrilla warfare. Um, so I, I don't necessarily think that, um, you know, driving, uh, a lot of people fear that, that it'll be a tremendous humiliation for, for um, Putin to see the uh, to see the rebels being driven out of Donetsk, well, there's, you know, he's, he's been pl playing the line of plausible deniability for a very long time. Um, that having been said, um, I, I always um, preface whatever I say about predicting Russia's future. It's said until September, until January 1992, uh, I was convinced the Soviet Union would be around, would certainly outlive me. <laughs> uh, the United States has imposed sanctions primarily targeting Russia's economy and the flow of investments into Russia, mainly issued against companies in Russia's defense and energy, energy, energy industries. So are we going to see a flight of funds from Russia in the coming months, do you think? Well, we've already seen a flight of funds uh, from Russia, something to the tune of, uh, I think, capital outflows of, uh, I forget whether it's 70 or 94 billion, those two numbers seem to be dancing around in my, in my head over the past year. Um, yes, of course, there's been a tremendous clap of capital flight. Um, on the other hand, uh, don't underestimate um, the, the willingness of, of Russians um, to sort of tough it out for the sake of national pride. Um, you know, these people who are <clears throat> perhaps wisely um, sending their money to the West, uh, also uh, a lot of them are, are patriotic Russians and they're still, you know, damned resentful. We don't, don't expect, just as we shouldn't expect consistency from our government, don't expect consistency from, from the Russian government or from, uh, from, from, Russian, um, from the Russian population. Well, and on, the, on, on that side, I mean, I imagine it's not just the Russian population, but there's a tendency for any group of people or any country when they feel like they're being attacked or being treated unfairly to hunker down and, you know, and, you know, say, we'll take it, we'll take the pain in order to, uh, in, in order to keep thumbing our nose or keep doing what we were doing and that, that other groups don't approve of. Yeah, I, I mean, Iran is a case in point. I mean, what, you know, the, 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 the sanctions that, that the Western world has placed on Iran. Well, it's gotten to talk a little bit about, um, 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 about, about curbing a nuclear program. Um, I'm not convinced, that, I'm, I'm not convinced that, that anything materially has really changed. So let's tie uh, human rights into this. And uh, does tying funding to human rights, democracy, the environment, and, and those, those things really matter anymore in the new economic order then? Well, certainly it's the policy, or it has been the policy, of the international economic institutions like the uh, IMF and the World Bank to associate funding um, with regimes that they feel uh, have effective rule of law so that the, um, the corrupt use of funds will be reduced. There's the new economic program for African development that was a big thing a few years ago when it appeared that the West's interest in, in promoting African development was waning because so many hundreds of billions of dollars have been put into Sub-Saharan African development and living standards in that part of the world were actually declining. So I think that, that certainly there's a notion that, that, that regimes that have stable democratic um, systems based on the rule of law uh, have a better chance of using developmental aid effectively. But, um, you know, uh, we haven't seen the the carrot of we'll give you more developmental aid if you become democratic um, actually lead into to effective uh, implementation of democratic change in, in this part of the world. So I, I think that that is a moment that's passed. Um, now you have the Chinese model which is explicitly um, uh, biased towards non-democratic regimes because they feel that the Chinese feel that they can function more effectively in regimes where they're not constrained by um, effective uh, legal systems. You know, um, the example that David gave of the pipeline here in Canada, you know, in a third world country um, under a dictatorship, if, if the funding is there to build a pipeline, the pipeline will be built. But in Canada, um, it's unlikely that the Chinese will invest in, in uh, ports, facilities, infrastructure, at Kitimat, until they have an assurance that that pipeline is going to happen over the next few years and as it stands now in our system it could be caught up in the courts for a very long time. So I, I, I do think that, that, that this idea that we're able to engender positive political change through the, the targeted use of, of, of trade aid and investment has not been borne out by, um, 
empirical uh, success. Sometimes it works the other way around. I mean, look at um, Canada's relationship with China. When when Harper came to um, when the Harper regime came into power, um, there's a lot of rhetoric about human rights uh, and the like, and that rhetoric has been softened uh, the more that um, <coughs> uh, that Ottawa became began to realize that uh, how important, uh, or at least uh, how important the promise, perhaps, of, of Chinese trade was, which has considerably softened uh, Canadian uh, rhetoric. Yeah, and on top of that, too, as I mentioned earlier, you've got a situation where the, where the model that is being, that, that the human rights uh, uh, calls are being attached to is less attractive to countries than it was would have been say uh, 15 or 20 years ago with the idea of uh, the idea of open capital markets and completely free trade um, is it's I don't know if it's been completely discredited but it's being largely called, it's being called in a que into question in a way that it wasn't uh, 10 years ago and so that makes it harder to to sell the idea of human rights as well but 2008 uh, yeah. I think really opened up a lot of people's eyes and uh, although the um, you know the protest movements that came in uh, you know that the occupy movement that, that came in instead have sort of dissipated. Um, you know, if you, if you read any American newspaper, you do realize that now there's, an, well, unless it's, of course, Fox News or the Wall Street Journal, but you do realize that, that even in America, um, the, the, the homeland of capitalism, uh, there, there's a, a strong debate now about rising inequality. And, um, you know, is the system perhaps corrupt? Yeah. I think the main thing is the example of the Chinese model, which is troubling to political scientists everywhere. I think there was an assumption that if China adopted market economic forms, that this would lead to the rise of the middle class, and the middle class would own property, and the middle class would therefore want to have participation in the political decisions that impinge on their property. So we assumed that, that um, market economies were dependent on um, democratic political institutions. And I think even the Chinese, uh, for a long time, also thought that because of the Marxist notion of the base and the infrastructure. You know, China signed the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights in 1998, and one has the impression that, you know, the intention of the government at that time was to move in that direction towards uh, rule of law and uh, separation of powers between the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. But now, uh, you know, quite a few years later, it's becoming apparent that China's uh, developmental strategy does not fall into the conventional categories of political science. We can't explain how it is that China is able to be so successful and sustain long-range economic growth while um, having a political system that's still based on the political norms of the Stalinist forms that were existing in China prior to their reform and opening in the, in the late 70s and early 80s. So, and of course, this unfortunately gives great um, encouragement to to authoritarian um, uh, repressive regimes that they don't need to to be supervised by human rights commissions and independent judiciaries and they can still get high economic growth rates because the Chinese example proves that that's possible. So I'm a bit despairing about the future of uh, democracy and civil society in the world in the light of the changes that are going on, including the one that you talk about, which is the change in the West where there's much greater polarization of of wealth mm -hmm. and, and more power for an elite class and, and commensurately less power for ordinary working people. I guess I guess the real question is how sustained will, will um, Chinese growth be? Uh, China's growth um, now I think has beaten the record, but that record was previously held for sort of sustained growth over, uh, over the immediate term. Uh, was held by Russia at the turn of the 20th century um, under under very dirigist regime, um, very much led by the center. You know, there were of course free. There, there was of course a stock exchange, and it was a quasi capitalist economy. But that tremendous growth between the late 1890s and the beginning of the 1900s um, was all state directed, um, and of course that came crashing down. I'm not saying that China is going to revolt, but it, it did come crashing down uh, <coughs> about uh, 20 about 15 years later. And, and I mean that's the, uh, another interesting thing to think about the relative economic strength of all these countries. Even though China is is rising in in, uh, in, in economic size, and again with a country of a billion people, you'd be surprised if it didn't eventually. Um, but when you look at it, even though the everyone a lot of people are down in the United States, uh, its economy and uh, it is largely you know it's the worst one in the world except for all the others. I mean. <laughs> 
Europe is, uh, it, it, you know, it's still trying it's to figure sclerotic, out. It's sclerotic, yes. It's sclerotic, but it's also trying to, it, 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 you know, it, it's trying to figure out, you know, can it still make the euro work? And it's having some problems there. China, uh, in a sense, I mean, to take the most pessimistic view in terms of economic growth, seems to also have the ticking time bomb of its own, uh, of its own financial sector, which, as we've seen with the, the 2008 global financial crisis, can have a very negative effect. Um, and other countries, um, like Brazil, are still aren't are, are quite at that level of you know potential global pretenders. So, the United States is still uh, it, it's still quite uh, again quite it, it still has a lot to play economically. Well, I certainly wouldn't count out America quite yet. Uh, I first came to America um, in 1967 um, when I was 10 years old. But I, one thing that really struck me at that point, really. I guess it shows you what kind of a nerd I was at the age of uh, 10, uh, were all the parallels that people were drawing in the late 60s between the Roman Empire and the American Empire. So the, the decline of the American Empire has been um, forecast already for a very long time. And that's it for our conversation. Uh, thank you all three for coming into the studio. Our guests, uh, all from Brock University, Charles Burton, Associate Professor of Political Science and China Expert, David Schimmelpenick, History Professor and Russia Expert, and Blaine Haggart, Assistant Professor of Political Science and a United States Expert. Fascinating uh, conversation. I thank all three of you for coming in and joining us this evening on the program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.